So hello everybody uh, and welcome to our third virtual Ask the Experts session. I'm Lizzie Rogers, I'm Head of Services at Target Ovarian Cancer and the team are really pleased that you can join us today for the session and I'm thrilled to welcome Dr Shabani Nikum today to answer your questions. Uh, Shabani is joined on our panel by Target Ovarian Cancer Nurse Advisor Valerie Lang. So this is a question and answer session and we've had loads of questions sent in in advance which I will ask to Val and Shabani on your behalf. So today is your chance to ask Shibani and Val your questions about treatments, research symptoms and side effects. Um, before we start, I'd like to ask you to remember that everybody here has really different circumstances and situations. Things that you hear, particularly about treatment and what to expect from the future might be relevant to you or your loved one, but they also may not. And likewise, everyone's at different stages and coping differently. Um, so please keep this in mind and respect everyone's views and concerns, particularly in the comments. Uh, I just ask you also to remember that anything that comes out of this session isn't medical advice and isn't a substitute for the information and advice you're given by your own clinical team. So we can't answer questions, uh, offer answers to very specific individual situations today. Um, the idea of this session is that we can give you some ideas and an overview um, that really enables you to go back to your team and ask the right questions. Um, if anything comes up today that you aren't sure about and um, what it means for you or your loved one, or if you have any other questions or concerns, then you can call our support line to get more information. Um, so I'm going to start the session by asking Shabani and Valerie to introduce themselves and also let us know if there are any questions that they hope someone will ask today. So Val, I'll start with you. Um, yeah, hi, I'm Val Lang. I'm um, one of the uh, nurse advisors on the support line at Target Ovarian Cancer. Some of you I will already know and um, some of you I won't, so hello to those. Um, questions. I just think that I hope that people will ask the questions um, that they want to ask and that nobody feels that there's a stupid question or a silly question. I think ask the questions and I hope that we get a really good overview of ovarian cancer all round and see it as a, if things are not relevant to you, as a, as a sort of teaching session really. Thank you. And Shabani? I think, again, like Val, I'm very happy to answer any sort of questions um, that are important to the group. And I guess one of the things that's my personal area of interest is about sort of personalising treatment and trying to develop better treatments that are more effective and less toxic. And I see from some of the questions that have come in already, that's a key part of the questions that are being asked by, um, by the group as well. So that's great. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I am a consultant medical oncologist specialising in the treatment of women's cancers, and I work in Oxford at the Cancer Centre. I'm the clinical and research lead for sort of gynaecological cancers in Oxford, but I'm also the chair of the National Cancer Research Institute gynaecological group, and our specialist interest there is in sort of developing clinical trials, looking at evaluating novel treatment options for women with all sorts of gynecological cancers. So I'm, I'm looking for these questions. I think they're gonna test me. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Shibari. Um, So to start with, we've received a lot of questions about personalized care. So I was wondering, Shibari, perhaps we could start by explaining what the standard treatment um, is that women might receive for ovarian cancer, and then we can move into some questions on personalized care. Okay, so following a diagnosis, your treatment will really be based around the stage and grade of your cancer. So for women with early stage cancers, they will often have a combination, will, ha will have surgery, and they may follow that up with adjuvant chemotherapy. For women who have more advanced cancers, they may have a combination of surgery and chemotherapy. And the timing of the surgery and the chemotherapy will be very much based on their sort of individual situation. So for some, that may mean they go and have surgery first, followed by chemotherapy. And for others, they may have um, chemotherapy, followed by surgery, followed by some more chemotherapy. So what we would call a neoadjuvant approach. And what happens will very much be dependent on the individual circumstances of, our, of that woman and that would determine how we would treat patients. 
A number of our patients will also go on and have maintenance therapies, and that may be things like bevacizumab or a PARP inhibitor. And again, um, things like your genetics situations so or whether you carry a BRCA mutation may determine that. So often the treatments may vary slightly, but most women will have a combination of surgery, chemotherapy, and possibly a maintenance treatment. Um, and that's fairly typical in the relapse setting as well, that the mainstay of treatment in the relapsed setting would be to have chemotherapy but a small proportion of women may be offered other treatment options or clinical trials as well. So when we talk about personalised care, Shivani, what, what do we understand that that means for women with ovarian cancer? So I think in a nutshell, it's really about thinking what the best treatment for that individual patient are. What is the best treatment at the right time, taking into account that individual patients' needs, their beliefs, there may be specifics about their particular cancer that we need to take into account, there may be genetics that we need to take into account. So it's really trying to optimize all of those things and having a sort of clear discussion with that patient so that we can give them some choice and some control over their own care plan. And really the, the end point of all of that is to make sure that we can keep them tumor free for as long as possible and that we maintain their quality of life for as long as possible. So it's really trying to optimize all of those factors to really have an individual care plan that suits that individual patient. Well, that's what I think it is, yeah. Thank you. Um, so we've had a lot of questions sent in advance by people who are interested in finding out more about what drugs are available to treat ovarian cancer and how effective they are. Um, so an example of the kind of question that we've had, um, so somebody's asked, um, women whose cancer returns are often offered chemotherapy and PARP inhibitor drugs. Are there any treatments available or in development that might avoid the need for chemotherapy? So that's a really important question because actually, you know, we know that the side effects of chemotherapy, both sort of physical and psychological, can have a huge impact on our patient group. So looking at treatments that are less toxic, that involve less visits to the hospital, are really, really important to us as a group. One of the things about chemotherapy is that carboplatin, which is generally the chemotherapy of choice, is just such a good treatment that actually anything we give, we want it to be as good as, if not better than carboplatin. And that's quite a big ask because it really is such an effective treatment in terms of controlling people's symptoms and their cancers. So probably the earliest trials that have looked at that haven't really found anything that is better than carboplatin. Although PARP inhibitors are as good as carboplatin. And certainly during the sort of COVID um, outbreak that we had, one of the key factors was whether we could give and use treatments that were less toxic. And so certainly at the moment in high grade ovarian cancers in women who carry a BRCA mutation and have relapse cancer, there is the option of using a PARP inhibitor instead of chemotherapy. So that's specifically during this sort of COVID period. For people with low-grade cancers, it, very recently, a drug called trametinib has also been approved um, by the Cancer Drugs Fund and by NICE for use instead of chemotherapy. And again, that is for a limited period during COVID to try and reduce some of the risks of having chemotherapy. But we hope that it might be something that stays online and potentially available to, to women following COVID as well. Great, thank you. Um, I think it might be a good time now, um, perhaps to just give a quick explanation of what a PARP inhibitor is and what it does. So a PARP inhibitor is um, an oral drug that targets DNA repair defects. And women that particularly carry um, the BRCA mutation, but also a group of women who may not carry the BRCA mutation have defects in DNA repair, in particular a pathway called homologous recombination. And these PARP inhibitor drugs particularly target this DNA um, defect in repair. 
and they specifically target cancer cells. So they are a, a way of inducing um, DNA damage that then that cell will sort of die off specifically within cancer cells. So they are a targeted treatment option. They induce something called synthetic lethality and that's something that people may have read about if they've read about PARP inhibitors. So they are particularly effective for women who carry damaged DNA um, pathways because if you then target other DNA pathways that also um, with the PARP inhibitor, you can actually kill off specifically tumor cells with this approach. And they are potentially less toxic than chemotherapy. They're an oral treatment. They can be given for as long as people are benefiting from treatment. And they have in particular groups of women been shown to improve um, survival in terms of between treatments. So we are still looking at some of the longer term data to look to see what the overall survival benefits are from this group of drugs. But certainly from the people that benefit, and we think there is a group within the BRCA population, but also beyond that population that benefit from, um, from PARP inhibitors. And, and they have potentially revolutionized care, both in sort of early stay, sort of early first line treatment, but also in relapsed um, ovarian cancer. Right. Um, we've um, received a question about um, PARP inhibitors and how they can be used with other drugs. So um, some women might be treated with Avastin, bevacizumab, um, or they might have heard about it. So somebody's asked us, are Avastin and PARP inhibitors used together in the UK? How does this work and how effective is it? It's quite a big question. Yeah. So PARP inhibitors at the moment are used on their own, usually following maintenance, uh, as a maintenance following chemotherapy. But there are trial data that have come out recently. So there's a study called the Paolo One study, which has shown that in combination with Avastin, they can be particularly effective in two groups of women. And the two groups they seem to be most effective in are again this group that carry the BRCA mutation, the BRCA mutation, but also in the group of women who carry this defect in DNA repair that may not be related to BRCA. And that's again called this homologous recombination defect. And the assay they use to assess whether somebody carries that defect is something called the Myriad My Choice assay. So, we can define a group beyond those women that have the BRCA mutation that may benefit from this combination of bevacizumab and alaparib. And the group that didn't carry the HR um, defect or a BRCA mutation didn't seem to benefit from this combination at all. So they would be a group that I wouldn't potentially use this combination in. So at the moment in the UK, it's not available but NICE are actually looking into this and, and they are assessing this combination. So it's quite possible over the sort of next few months that it is a combination that may be, that may be um, approved for some women. So let's hope that comes through. Great, thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, just to give people a little bit of context, you might, PARP inhibitor drugs are, and Shabani, correct me if I'm wrong, Alaparib, Niraparib and Rucaparib at the moment. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, so somebody's uh, we've got a question that's been sent in during the session now. So somebody's asked um, why might PARP inhibitors stop working? So that is probably the million dollar question that we are looking into. And there's probably different reasons in different women. So even though you may carry a BRCA mutation or there may be other factors that make you sensitive to a PARP inhibitor, we don't still understand what all of the reasons are that would make you sensitive to a PARP inhibitor. So we know that BRCA is really, really important. And we know that probably this HR deficiency is important. And although I mentioned the My Choice assay, we still don't have a sort of gold standard assay in which to define HR deficiency. So A, we're not sure exactly who benefits beyond BRCA, we're still defining that. Um, and so the reasons why someone may then stop responding 
may be because of mutations that occur. So they may be mutations that occur within the BRCA gene, just in the natural course of someone's um, cancer progress. There may be certain cells that develop resistance to those drugs, either because of mutations or other changes at a biochemical level that we don't understand yet. Um, so I think that it, there is a lot of work that is still being done to look into why we might um, we might lose the effectiveness of PARP inhibitors. And what we're also trying to do is combine that with trials that are looking at combinations. So sometimes when you give combinations of drugs, it reduces the risk of, re of um, resistance developing, or it may be that you, when you become resistant, you add in an extra drug that hopefully reverses that resistance. So that is a, an area of a lot of research at the moment. Okay, um, and related to um, kind of the last answer, somebody's asked, how do you know if you have the HR deficiency and is testing available? So that's a key thing that is probably going to be the next chance of testing. So at the moment, increasingly across the country, people are being offered BRCA testing, and that may be a blood test or on their tumour, because that gives them access to um, PARP inhibitors such as Olaparib, Niraparib or Recaparib. Um, but we realise that that may be a group beyond that, so this HR deficiency. And at the moment, we don't know what the best test is for that group of patients. So it's likely in order to access combinations such as that with Avastin, that we might use assays that have been validated within the trial. So it might be this My Choice assay. Um, and at the moment, there are two assays. There's one that's being done by Foundation Medicine and one that's being done by Myriad. Um, and there is an academic collaboration um, with the NCRI and with a number of groups across the world that are looking at developing an academic test that has the required level of sensitivity that we want. Um, so at the moment, it's not standard practice. That may change, particularly if Avastin and Olaparib combinations are to be used, because I suspect that NICE will want us to specifically identify that group that have the HR deficiency. So the short answer, there isn't, there is a test or there are a couple of tests. They're not routinely in use, but that may change in the sort of coming months or year. Great, thank you. Um, so moving on a little bit, we've had a, a quite a lot of interest in um, off-label medicines. Yep. Um, so somebody's asked, um, do they work to treat cancer or delay it coming back? Um, and is there wide acceptance of this? So um, perhaps in your answer, Shivani, you could just touch on what off-label medicines mean um, and um, what your approach might be towards someone who is interested in using them. I think off-label medicines means different things to different people. It could mean taking supplements. And, you know, I think that there are some supplements that can be helpful. I think vitamin C, can, as, as there is some evidence of, of you know, people of well-being, but I think it's really important if you're going to take a supplement that you check with your oncologist and with your cancer pharmacist that this isn't going to interfere with any medication that you're taking as an anti-cancer treatment, because some of them do. For example, St. John's wort um, can interact with things like PARP inhibitors. So it's really important if you are going to take any supplements whilst you're taking anti-cancer medication that you get that checked with your doctor and with your cancer pharmacist. It, off-label drugs may be sort of old drugs that have been repurposed for use in cancer, but haven't really been through any rigorous sort of clinical trials. And when I think of sort of off-label things, you might, people might be taking things like metformin um, or combinations of metformins and statins. And there isn't good trial data that suggests that these drugs are effective in ovarian cancer. And so it's really important, again, that you discuss um, the reasons for taking those drugs with your doctors um, to see whether there are other more sort of licensed medications that may be available to you. You know, maybe that you're eligible for a Bastin or for a PARP inhibitor, or that other drugs such as tamoxifen or letrozole, et cetera, may be more um, beneficial. So I think if you want to take something off label, 
I'm very much of the thought that any treatments that we give you should be should have evidence of benefit. And that should be through clinical trials that have shown that they are non, not as not toxic, that they're safe to use and that they have benefit. And if they fulfill that criteria, then it's then it's it's a good thing to try. If you have specific things that you've heard about or read about um, as oncologists, we're very happy to discuss that with individual patients and maybe have a chat with your doctors um, and go through what the benefits and what the risks might be. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, so just um, going back around to uh, uh, PARP inhibitors um, and kind of newer treatments, um, somebody's asked us how equal is access to the most up-to-date treatments and is there any difference depending on where you live or whether you have a BRCA mutation? So I think that there are different levels of access to different drugs depending on um, whether you live in England or in the devolved nations. So there may be slightly different access. In England, we have the Cancer Drugs Fund, which gives access to a specific um, agent such as the Vastin in the first line setting. Whereas in Scotland, I know that it's not available first line, it's available in the relapse setting. So in platinum resistance, which is something we, we can't use in England. So there are some differences. I don't think that there are sort of postcode lotteries that we used to think of. And the Cancer Drugs Fund has been, has been you know, a very good way of addressing some of the postcode lotteries that there used to be sort of five, 10 years ago. But there are differences between where you live. If you live in sort of England or one of the devolved nations, um, there may well be differences in access. And I hope that there aren't differences in access in terms of um, genetic testing. I hope that's something that is now widely available. There's been a lot of work that's been done by clinicians, by the NCRI, by the charities, by you know, the British Society, uh, uh, Gyne Society as well. So I think a lot of people have worked very hard to ensure that there's equitable access to sort of BRCA testing and from there to PARP inhibitors. Um, but certainly there can be some differences based on, on access to the Cancer Drugs Fund. Right, thank you. Um, so we've received a number of questions on research and new treatments. Um, so someone's asked about clear cell ovarian cancer. So they've said, what are the main treatments for clear cell ovarian cancer? Are there new treatment regimes in the offing? Yeah, so clear cell cancer is, is a really important thing because when we talk about ovarian cancer, a lot of times we're talking about high grade cancers, particularly the serous cancers, because they make up sort of 80% of the cancers that we are seeing um, within our clinics. And um, clear cells are much rarer cancers, but we treat them standardly very much the way that we would treat high grade serous cancers. So depending on the, the stage of your cancer, it will involve surgery and generally some chemotherapy. It may involve the sort of neoadjuvant approach I talked about where you have chemotherapy first if surgery is not feasible, um, followed by surgery and further chemotherapy. There are mutations that are specific to clear cell cancer. So they tend not to carry this sort of BRCA mutation, but there are other mutations such as the ARID1A mutation, which is um, uh, particularly prevalent within clear cells. So there are new trials that are looking at particularly targeting women and using specific combinations. So there's a couple of trials that, that are NCRI developed and led um, in the UK at the moment. There's the Peacock study which is evaluating the use of immunotherapy in clear cell cancers. And there's also the Atari study, which is looking at a combination of a Laparib and an ATR inhibitor in women who carry this um, ARID1A mutation. So yes, there's a lot of interest now because um, we realize that there are specific, specific differences between high-grade serous and clear cell cancers. And we've now got drugs that may be helpful specifically in those cancers. Um, and we, we know that immunotherapy to date in high grade serous hasn't been as useful, but it may be that in clear cell cancers that it's much more um, beneficial in that group of women. So that's something we're, we're looking at through Peacock. 
So definitely um, think about clinical trials and your access to those. They're not running in all the centers in the UK, but um, your, your, your oncologist should be able to help with that. Uh, likewise, we've been asked about um, low-grade serous. Um, so um, would women with low-grade serous be eligible for those trials? Are there other research going on? Um, so low-grade serous, again, probably only makes up about 5 to 10% of all the serous cancers that we see. So it's a rarer form of um, serous cancer. And I'd still say the mainstay of treatment is predominantly surgery. Um, and chemotherapy has been shown to be sort of um, potentially helpful. It's probably not as helpful as it is in high-grade cancers, but it's still something we use for, for a number of women with low-grade cancers. And so often these women will also have a combination of surgery, possibly chemotherapy, and possibly a hormone treatment. So we, we would potentially use hormone treatments such as letrozole or tamoxifen in this group of patients. But there are newer drugs as well coming through that are targeting specific um, alterations in the MEK pathway. And there's been a couple of drugs that have shown um, benefit. There's a drug called uh, selumetinib, which showed um, particular uh, shrinkage in this group of women, and also a newer drug called trametinib, which targets this particular pathway. And there's a, there's a trial um, called the LOGS trial, which recently showed an improvement in overall survival, or, well, a trend to um, an improvement in overall survival, and, in, and a sort of longer time between progression um, in the group that received trametinib. And interestingly, very recently, um, NICE have approved during the COVID period, they've also approved trametinib instead of chemotherapy in women who have advanced low-grade cancers. Um, at the moment, there aren't specific trials running, but um, there are a couple of trials internationally that are in, in development. So I hope that in the next sort of 12 months or so, we are sort of moving towards opening some specific trials in low grade um, because we've just finished uh, two or three trials and their results are coming through. And so we're hoping now to build on some of the information from those trials to develop new, new studies for women. Great, thank you. Um, we've also had interest about whether there are any new developments for platinum resistant or refractory ovarian cancer um, and for women who are BRCA negative. Yeah, so again, the standard of care here very much is chemotherapy. We know for the women who carry the BRCA mutation that, that PARP inhibitors may have activity levels around the same as chemotherapy. But those without the BRCA mutation who relapse within six months of prior platinum probably don't gain much benefit from um, a PARP inhibitor. So it's an area really where clinical trials are really important. At the moment, we have the DICE study look running in the UK, which is looking at role of mTOR inhibitors in combination with chemotherapy. We have the PROMPT trial, which is looking at immunotherapy following weekly taxol chemotherapy. And we are in the sort of very early stages of discussions of developing a couple of new arms to um, a study called the OCTOPUS trial, which is looking to evaluate new agents in combination with weekly taxol. So again, I'm hopeful that over the next sort of six to 12 months that we'll have another arm of the octopus trial open with another novel agent potentially. And that's, that trial's running in about 14 or 15 centers across the whole of the UK. So yes, it's an area where we're definitely looking at, we're really interested. Um, there are a few trials running, but I'm hopeful by you know, next year that we'll have another couple of arms to that trial. Great, thanks. And, um... We've had a in really interesting question um, from the Facebook comment. So somebody has asked, what do you think about CAR T cell therapy, which is a type of immunotherapy? Um, could it be available for ovarian cancer in the near future? 
Um, so it is a really interesting um, area and it's still very early in the sort of research um, arena in ovarian cancer. So I think it may well be available through clinical trials, but I don't see it coming online very quickly as a sort of standard therapy, but definitely a sort of area um, that we're sort of looking at within the NCRI as well as to sort of how we can look at novel immunotherapy approaches for use in ovarian cancer. So to give people some background on what CAR T is, it's a kind of personalized immunotherapy treatment that's currently just been licensed for blood cancers. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of interest um, in the cancer community about the possibilities of that. Um, fab. And then another research question. Um, so uh, we've had a question from someone who mentions that they're a young ovarian cancer survivor. Um, and they want to know, is there any research um, specifically for young women? But I think actually we can probably apply this across the board. And um, people often ask us, um, is there any research that they can contribute their DNA or tissues to that will make a difference to other people? Um, so I guess some of the centers are running something called the Brit Rock trial, which is looking at collecting um, samples. There may be individual sample collections that are ongoing within individual cancer centers at the moment. So definitely worth speaking to your oncologist because um, tissue uh, routine serum samples are being collected and stored uh, within sort of individual projects. There isn't a big national collection of data, certainly within all of the clinical trials that we are running. So if anyone's part of a clinical trial, they will be having um, bloods regularly, and that will include research bloods that we will be storing for future research. Um, we don't have a big national repository at the moment, but a lot of academic centers are collecting uh, tumor and also blood samples at follow-up. So it may be something that's running within individual um, cancer centers. Um, and that kind of leads me nicely into some questions about genetics and BRCA BRCA mutations. So um, we received several questions about the influence of family history and genetics on ovarian cancer, um, both from family members who are interested in managing their risk and also women who want to know more about how genetics might influence their treatment, which we've already touched on. Um, but um, perhaps it might be helpful for us to touch on why women with ovarian cancer might be tested for uh, BRCA gene um, again, um, in particular, um, and then we can move into some of the um, questions that we've received. So Shabani, if you could just give us a brief overview of BRCA. Okay. I'll do a quick potted history of BRCA. Yeah. Uh, so BRCA is a really important gene in DNA repair. And so if you have um, faulty DNA repair, that can put you at higher risk of developing certain cancers. And that's because we're all exposed to um, you know, radiation, we might smoke, we might drink, there may be environmental factors that cause damage to our DNA. And usually we have um, two genes. And so actually DNA repair um, it happens all the time. But if you have faulty DNA repair, it means that some of these cells can become damaged and then undergo sort of uncontrolled growth and lead to the development of cancers. So BRCA is one of the um, genes that's been particularly implicated in ovarian cancer. So we think that probably between sort of 15 and 25%, if you look at sort of, um, uh, if you look at sort of tumor testing as well as um, uh, serum testing, sort of looking for genetic um, influences. So we know that BRCA is probably the most actionable mutation within ovarian cancer. And because it, it affects over 10% of women, it's pretty prevalent as well. So actually now we have an actionable mutation, something that we can actually treat so we feel it's really important that we test all of our high grade serous cancers patients to make sure that we don't miss patients that may benefit from a particularly effective treatment such as a PARP inhibitor. 
Now, clearly, some of the research has now shown that there's a group of women beyond BRCA, and that's what we talked about with in terms of the HRD testing as well. And so this could be another group of women that we need to start testing. BRCA has implications because this could be something that could be passed from one family member, so from a parent to a child. And so it's also important in terms of how it might impact a family. So it's important for the individual because it might give rise to new treatment options, but it's important to the family because if they carry that genetic mutation, they may have inadvertently passed it on to other family members, you know, to their offspring. So I think it has two reasons why we really should be testing. We should be testing in terms of the individual, in terms of treatment, but also for the family and how it might impact them and what additional screening to prevent cancers. Um, so those are the two main reasons for testing for BRCA. Great. Um, so the first question we've had on this is, um, is genetic testing like the one performed by Oncologica worth doing for ovarian cancer? And what kind of personalized therapies um, can it lead to? And then they've gone on to ask, does one have to do the genetic testing at every recurrence? So I think that's a really important question actually. And at the moment, we're not testing people at every recurrence. And it probably isn't going to become standard that we would do that in the sort of very near future. And I think that's because the, the majority of the mutations that we see in ovarian cancer are in a, um, a gene called the P53 gene and also in, in terms of BRCA and BRCA probably accounts for, as, as I mentioned, about 25% of it. And the rest of the causes of sporadic ovarian cancer are not necessarily due to sort of specific mutations. They're due to abnormalities in terms of chromosomes and sort of aberrations in terms of copy number of those. So testing specifically for mutations may not take us much further. Now we are collecting information through the Bridge Rock study to see what impact changes in terms of mutations and copy number have as people's cancers return and progress. So it could be that in the future, when we look through some of that information and data that we, we change our mind and think at specific time points, people should have um, repeat biopsies and testing. But at the moment, that isn't the standard of care. Um, so at a personal level, this still remains very sort of experimental as to whether we should test at each recurrence. Now, tests like Oncologica, there's other ones like the Myriad, the Foundation test, they may be helpful. And in different tumours, they may be helpful in different situations. So I mentioned in clear cell, we're looking for ARID1 mutations. In mucinous cancers, there may be sort of ARID1 mutations, there may be PIK-C3A mutations. In low-grade cancers, there may be other mutations such as BRAF and RAS. So certainly in specific situations, it may be that these tests add to a person's um, choice for treatment and may be useful. Um, so I, I think that we probably will move to more testing, um, such as an Oncologica Myriad Foundation. But at the moment, it's all about how does that change your treatment? So it's only worth having a test if it's going to somehow impact the treatment options that we might offer you. Um, and I think we are working to much more personalised agents through tests such as these, but we're just not quite there yet, I think. And um, but something... for specific individuals, it's still worth discussing. Sorry, <laughs> no, <laughs> because no, it it's may fine. be a specific, you know, patient. It's useful. Sorry. <laughs> fine. Um. So, am I right in thinking that these um, uh, kind of tests, um, beyond the kind of um standard bracket testing that most women will be offered? Um, the more sophisticated or the tests that you've just mentioned aren't currently available on the NHS. Is that correct? That's exactly right. Yep, exactly right. Um, great. Um, so um, let's see what we should ask next. Um, so we've had tons of questions about genetics now, so which is making me think we need to get a geneticist in next time. Um, so um, somebody's asked, uh, should patients with low-grade serous get their tumours tested? Um, and would this be available on the NHS? 
Um, so I, I guess it depends what you mean by testing. Um, if you're talking about sort of whether they should be offered myriad or foundation testing, at the moment, it probably doesn't add much in terms of what treatments we would offer. So trametinib, um, as I said, is now sort of uh, approved for use instead of chemotherapy, and it doesn't require any testing for that. Um, we know that the majority of low grade cancers will carry this sort of BRAF or RAS mutations potentially. And we aren't particularly targeting those treatments at the moment. So within clinical trials, we are testing tumors and we are um, trying to sort of modify our treatment options based on that. Whether it should be available on the NHS, I'm not sure that that's where we are yet, but it's something that we may get to in the future. Um, for low grade cancers specifically. Um, and then we've also had a question. Well, we had several I'm questions sorry, about. Sorry, can you hear me, Shivani? Yep, I can hear you. Yep. Yeah, great. Okay, I think there's a bit of a delay. <laughs> um, so no, we've had um, a question um, about um, family history. So we've been asked. Is monitoring available for women who have a strong family history of ovarian cancer, but where there is no known BRCA mutation in the family? Okay, so I think sort of specifics like this definitely need to be discussed with the geneticists, with their own geneticists, because we know that BRCA accounts for some of the ovarian cancers that run in families, but they can be clusters related to other genes. And it may be that your geneticist would want to test for other genes, um, specifically within the family. And based on that testing, they may then advise additional screening for family members. So I think in specific cases where there's a strong family history, but no definite mutation, I think that that's important to speak to the geneticist for your individual case to see whether any additional screening should be offered. If it's BRCA that runs through the family and you're BRCA negative, hopefully your geneticist would have said to you that your risk is not above that of the sort of general population because you don't carry the BRCA gene. But it's always worth, if you have any concerns about sort of family history and cancers running in the family, that you have a chat with your geneticist who's done the test so that they can look at your sort of individual genetic makeup to decide what screening is available and what should be done. Great, right. thank you. Um, so I'm afraid due to time pressures, we're gonna to have to move on um, from this section, um, although we've had so much interest in this. Um, but we had quite a few questions as well about kind of health and well-being. So alongside drug treatment, we also know that it's really important to focus on your wider well-being, both physical and mental. Um, so we've been asked how much of a part does diet, um, exercise and or supplements play in the outcome of your diagnosis and um, how successful treatment is? So diet and supplements. Um, I think that your well-being is so important and so fundamental to how you manage treatment. And what we're trying to do with any of the treatments we do is to keep you well. So anything that you can do to sort of help yourself as part of that is, is you know, it helps you psychologically, it helps you physically deal with your treatment and with the side effects of that treatment. So I think it's massively important and probably underestimated by us as oncologists because we're so busy telling you about the sort of specific side effects of drugs and, you know, that we probably don't touch upon that as much as we should. Um, so I, I actually think that, you know, things like, you know, moderate exercise, taking a sort of multivitamin, actually sort of making sure you're eating a healthy, balanced diet are important. I don't think there's specific exclusions and there may be, you know, certain groups of women who have particularly sort of bowel related symptoms where specific exclusion diets are helpful, such as the sort of low residue diets. But on the whole, if you're well in yourself, there's no particular sort of exclusions that I would say. Um, 
there are sort of interests in things like vitamin C, high dose vitamin C, and how that can improve people's well being. Um, and again, I think if you have specific supplements you want to take, it's really important that you discuss the supplements that you bring them in and, and um, discuss that with your oncologist and they'll probably get the cancer pharmacist to check that there isn't anything that interferes with your anti-cancer medication. So um, very much I think the sort of holistic side of the treatment of, of, of all of our women is really really important and, and it's, it goes hand in hand with the anti-cancer treatments that we're using. Thanks. And Val, I'm wondering if there's anything, you know, when people ring you up and they want to know kind of what they can actively be doing in terms of kind of safeguarding their well-being and making themselves feel better. Is there any particular advice that you would uh, give to women if they came to you with that beyond what Shivani said? I think actually exactly what Shivani said. Um, just I think we're all equal on this one, actually. It, it's about advice for the general population, you know, eat well, exercise, sleep well. And just generally look after your, your, your sort of physical health, which in turn impacts your mental health. So just a good, healthy lifestyle and, and it, try not to obsess too much about special diets, etc. apart from, as Shivani says, you know, people who need sort of low residue diet, that sort of thing. But yeah, ju just live well and as healthily as you possibly can do. Yeah, um, so some of the, um, you know, some people will have specific struggles with um, eating or not eating and kind of uh, side effects of treatment. So if somebody wanted um, to go about getting access to a dietitian or some specialist advice, um, what would you recommend in terms of going about um, accessing those services? I, I would... Is that me or Val? Yeah, people who um, you can uh, speak to your clinical nurse specialist about referral to a dietitian or your consultant and any member of your treating team, um, you know, if, if that is what you need. Or also there is, um, we have online, don't we, Lucy, the um, webinar that we did with um, the dietitian that talked specifically about the diet, exercise, living well, eating well, and um, so people could have a look at that as a starting point. Thank you. Um, so um, in terms of diet as well, something that people often ask us is about estrogen and um, also about um, sugar. So um, someone's asked with estrogen positive cancers, um, is it estrogen that fuels that cancer? And are there any foods that you, you should avoid? Because um, people often talk about dairy products having estrogen in. Um, so, uh, Sorry, this is a very long uh, question for a very short question. Should um, women with ovarian cancer um, with estrogen positive cancers restrict estrogen in their diet? Um, and also people generally ask us about um, sugar. So should people with cancer restrict sugar in their diet? I'd be interested to hear your thoughts, maybe starting with Shivani. So the links between estrogen fueling ovarian cancer are not as um, obvious and are not as straightforward as they are in breast cancer and so some of the cancers can can have estrogen receptor positivity and some don't and so we don't believe that there is a big strong link between any sort of dietary estrogen that you might take in and that fueling the cancer and certainly in some high-grade cancers particularly the serous cancers we would use HRT in, in some women who are particularly struggling with um, symptoms of menopause. In endometrioid type cancers where they are strongly ER positive, again, there isn't any strong evidence that you should be avoiding dietary sort of phytoestrogens. So I would just echo what Val has said. Really, it's just a healthy, balanced diet. Um, and again, sugar's not great for you, whether you've got cancer or not. So cutting down on sugar um, as much as you can is, I think, just good for people's well-being. Generally, it helps, you know, um, in, in many ways. And it can help your mood as well, because people know about the kind of sugar crashes that we get. So I think reducing sugar, but also enjoying your life as well. So if you want to eat a piece of cake, go have a piece of cake. <laughs> Thank you. Val, anything to add to that? I agree totally about the cake. Um, <laughs> good advice. Um, yeah, I, I, I just think 
healthy lifestyle and I think you know when um the families it isn't just women with ovarian cancer but the whole family can be involved in it just you know if you all eat well and and um live well that that all helps and, and helps everybody thank you um so we only have six minutes left um so we're going to move into a couple of final questions um, so women often tell us that they struggle with the fear that their cancer might return. Um, so we've been asked, um, what are the early warning signs to watch out for that it's come back? Um, and also, what advice would we give someone who's finding it hard to deal with the worries um, about recurrence? So um, perhaps, Shivani, you could um, cover the early warning signs and then we'll move to Val in terms of um, coping elements. Yeah, so I guess the symptoms that we ask our patients about every time we see them are generally bowel related because the majority of these cancers, when they come back, they tend to come back within the sort of abdomen and pelvis and they cause disruptions to maybe your appetite. So you might find that you are not feeling hungry or you're feeling full quickly after meals. You may find that your bowel habit has changed. So, you know, you may be getting a bit more diarrhea or constipation, whether you're getting a bit of bloating or pain or whether there's any changes in, um, the, in your sort of water work. So whether you're sort of peeing more frequently or there's pain. So those are the sort of specific symptoms we would often ask about um, at consultations. And what we say is that if you have that on the odd day, it probably isn't a sign of anything. But if over a two or three week period, that's happening on most days or it's becoming more troublesome, then we probably want to know about that. And we'd ask you to have some blood tests and probably see you a bit sooner in clinic so that we could reassess just to make sure that there was nothing going on. I mean, we'd obviously exclude other things like urinary infections or, you know, kind of gastroenteritis, things like that. So I think those are the main symptoms that I'd be sort of looking out for. They would be sort of warning signals for me. Okay. And Val, what advice would you give to someone who was struggling to cope with the fear that um, cancer might return? Um, I think probably the first thing I would want to say is that that's normal, um, particularly once, you know, in early days after finishing treatment. Um, so don't worry about worrying about it. Second thing is talk about it and to any relatives watching, allow women to talk about it. So often we do get phone calls from people saying, oh, nobody will let me say anymore that I'm worried or so it's normal to do talk about it. You can ring us to talk about it if you, if you, you know, want to talk to somebody more anonymous about it. Um, I think if it becomes, if you find that it's occupying too much of your thoughts, and you're finding that you're not enjoying your days because you're worrying all the time about recurrence, then certainly talk to your clinical nurse specialist. You know, it's well known that people do struggle psychologically after a cancer diagnosis, and there is help available. So she would be able to put you in the direction of specialists, so counsellors, psychologists that can help you to um, just sort of compartmentalise some of the fear and, and help you to... Uh, you know, move on to a more normal sort of thought process and, and um, you know, generally feel better about it. Great, thanks, Val. Um, I'm afraid we're going to have to come to an end now, um, but um, I'm just going to ask us to close. I'm starting with Val. Um, if, you know, if we could ask women to take one thing, well, women and family members to take away one thing from today's Q&A um, as they leave, what would you um, want them to take away? Oh, I, I, you know, Lizzie, I can't answer that one. I think actually not one thing, it's just a wealth of knowledge. I think it's been a brilliant session. I think um, everyone must have learned such a lot, even if not particularly relevant to them. Um, I think Shivani's been wonderful and, and I just hope that, that everyone's enjoyed it and learned things. Great, and Shivani? I hope that people take away that there is so much work going on in terms of developing new treatments, better treatments, less toxic treatments, that we are understanding more and more about all of these different cancers and how they sort of, how individual they are and how 
we are now exploring the kind of the, the genetics of these cancers, which will hopefully bring us to sort of better and more personalized treatments. And I think there has been a massive acceleration in some of that work over the last five years. Um, and so many new treatments have come online, even in the last sort of three or four years, that have really revolutionized outcomes and treatment choices for women. And so I hope that they take a really positive sort of um, that there's a lot going on within individual centers, ask your oncologist, take part in clinical trials, because all of that is sort of helping the community sort of develop better treatments. Great, thank you Shivani. Um, so we're going to come to a close now, thank you so much everybody for joining us. Um, we hope you enjoyed it and we hope you found it helpful. Um, I'm conscious that we had tons and tons and tons of questions um, this time um, and some of them we haven't been able to answer. We will post our support line details up in the comments if that hasn't already happened and you can get in touch with us on the phone or by email as well so you can just pop your question through to us on email if that's your preferred mode of getting in touch. Um, if you would like to re-watch the webinar, the video is going to remain available in the Facebook group. Um, and if you think of anyone else, the webinar or this group might benefit, please invite them to the ovarian cancer community. Um, our next event is an online mindfulness session on Thursday, the 10th of September, and we'd love to see you there. So thank you so much for joining us and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Bye. Thanks. <laughs>